Welcome to Carbon. I'm Steve Dynan, CEO of Carbon. This is Jeff Westfall. He's my lead race car driver and also product strategist at Carbon. Uh, we're doing a series called Tech Tip Tuesday, where every Tuesday we're going to bring you a technical explanation of what we're working on and why we're working on it. Today we're talking about intercoolers and heating changers on modern BMWs. So this is a new uh, 2025 M5 G90 here. And in almost all the new modern BMWs, they have what's called an air to water heat intercooler and it goes on the intake manifold or before the intake manifold. And what it does is it turbo blows air across it and it turns that heat and transfers it into the core and then the core sends water out. And the hot water goes to an outside radiator, which is called a heat exchanger, which is right here. And the heat exchanger then has cold air, ambient air passing over to take the heat out and then send cold air, cold water, excuse me, back into the intercooler. This reduces the temperature of the intake charge and increases the air density and makes more power. Why is a cold intake charge important? Well, the colder the air is, the closer the oxygen molecules are together, basically, and you have more oxygen and you're mixing fuel with oxygen. And the more oxygen and fuel you have, the more power you have. That's where the power comes from. So you could say that hot air is going to make less power and cold air will make more power. Absolutely. Got it. By a lot. Yeah. So anyway, in fact, there's actually a correction chart in SAE. You put an engine on a dynamometer, you correct for barometric pressure, temperature and humidity. Temperature is one of the primary corrections. Got so it. power goes down with heat. You can actually measure it and calculate it. <laughs> I'm sure you've never done that. I've done way too much of that. <laughs> anyway, so um, BMW puts this really large heat exchanger here to get rid of the heat. It's, it's big, it's like the size of a radiator. The problem is, is that when you raise the turbo boost, to try and make more power, it wasn't designed for that. It was designed for the stock engine to get rid of all the heat that the engine could produce and make the temperature very stable. So the temperature goes up. And when the temperature goes up, the power goes down, but also the computer senses the temperature goes up and it retards the ignition timing and or lowers the boost to cut power back to protect your engine. So correct me if I'm wrong here, but when you increase the boost from a turbocharger, that little bearing and that assembly that spins creates more heat, the more boost you ask for. Correct. As you compress air, it generates heat. So the more boost you run, the more heat that the turbocharger or supercharger generates and then the power goes down. The point of the intercooler is to take that heat back out again on the way the engine returns as close as you can to ambient temperature or like what a naturally aspirated engine would see. Because you're adding more air by a request of more boost, but that air is becoming hotter. Correct. And if you don't fix the temperature of the air, making more power is extremely difficult. Yes. Uh, you'll definitely gain some power by just turning the boost up, but it becomes less and less efficient Got the it. more boost you add, unless you do something about the heat. So if you add more boost and more heat, you need to get rid of that heat if you want to be efficient in making all the power that's available. That's correct, yes. Got it. You got it. <laughs> so the problem is, is that when you make more power, you want to put a bigger one of these in, but there's a radiator support on top. There's the bottom of the car on the bottom. You have to clear the road and curves. Speed bumps. Speed bumps. And then you have the frame rails on each side, so there's only so much room you can put the heat exchanger in. And BMW has kind of consumed all this space already, trying to make it as efficient as possible. Uh, what Everybody else in the aftermarket does except for Carbon is they put a thicker one of these in. The problem with the thicker one is, is the front of the, of the heat exchanger, the heat passes through it and it gets passed to the back of it. And as you go deeper and deeper into the core, the heat exchanger becomes less and less efficient because you're feeding the back of it with hot air from the front when you exchange it. Um, the air is heating up as it passes. So the correct. back of the core, although it's thicker, is getting hot air and it's not transferring as much of the heat as it could. Yes. And this is true of even an engine radiator. So if you like a look at NASCAR, you go to a super speedway like Daytona, they'll put a, like a really thick core in because they're going 200 miles an hour and they'll tape up the front of the car to reduce drag. And they know that the air will go through it because they're going 200. But then they go to a short track or road course where they're averaging like 100, 120. The air won't get through there. The engine will overheat. So they take the tape off, put a thinner one on and make more surface area. So we get rid of the heat efficiently. And they just give up some with less space constraints than an OEM car. With less space constraints than an OEM car, but it works in any kind of heat exchanger. Which brings us to the next point: surface area is more is more effective. If you make the radiator just bigger instead of thicker, you're not passing hot air to the back. The entire radiator heat exchanger has seen cold air or ambient air in the front, and it makes it more efficient. Seems like the way you'd want to do it. It is the way you'd want to do it. So what we did here at Carbon, instead of making a thicker core here, we added a secondary core here. Uh, so it's one right here on the camera. It's really light too, only 2.85 pounds. Check nice. it out. So yeah. it's not adding a lot of weight to your car. It's very surprisingly light. light. And what we do is we add 40% more area, but it's not very thick. It's kind of thin. So we're not dumping hot air from the front to the back. It's just very, very efficient. And it's 40% more area. And is this racing technology? Yeah, so racing heat exchanger core. Got it. Yeah. 
uh, the, the, what really happens in the end is when you turn the boost up, let's say even a, even a mild tune, let's call it a stage two, uh, where you're trying to add like 100, 150 horsepower, which is pretty standard what people do. The temperature on the heat exchanger stock, when we measure on our car, went from 33 degrees to 37 and a half degrees, it gained four and a half degrees of cent and centigrade. Um, and then when we put our core in, it went from 33 degrees down to 30, it lost three degrees. So actually, our core is so efficient as the car goes faster, the charge air temperature goes down. So theoretically, of, uh, when you're driving the car, you're gonna see a, a more powerful gain from the airflow yeah. rather than a heat soak where it goes the wrong direction. Right, right. So the, the combination of the difference between the OEM heat exchanger and our heat exchanger is seven and a half degrees centigrade, which is 13.5 degrees Fahrenheit. Which when you go to your SAE correction table, is 25 degrees if there's no turbo, if you just correct the temperature. So if the ignition timing was fixed, you had no boost, it's 25 horsepower on an 800 horsepower engine. Just from 13 and a half degrees. Correct. But if you add the turbo correction where it retards the timing because it's trying to protect the engine uh, or lowers the boost, we measure typically around 50 wow. horsepower from the heat exchanger. Interesting, that's now, quite a lot. It's a lot. Now the other thing it does is it make it smoother when the software sees the engine getting hot and sees that the engine's gonna detonate or ping, it does corrections and sometimes you can feel the correction. Retarding the timing, reducing the boost, but it does it on the fly. Right. And you might notice it on a dyno with a choppy graph. Ch choppy dyno graph and sometimes you can feel it by the seat of the pants if you're paying attention. Or inconsistent pulls, like if you get good power one pull and then the engine heats up, the next one might not be the same. Yes, exactly right. Especially if you live in someplace hot like Texas or Florida, Florida or Alabama, where it's, you know, it could be 100, 110 degrees in the summertime with 80, 90% humidity. You're further up that temperature curve already. Right, and by the way, that 25 horsepower uh, with straight correction and 50 with the turbo was done on a like 75, 80 degree day in California, where the air is cool and crisp and so on a hot climate, it's much worse than that. So we, we require to have our warranty the heat exchanger with our stage two software, because one, we want to protect the engine. We don't want you to have a problem, uh, but also we know it's going to run a lot better. And you're going to be a lot more satisfied. Particularly if you're doing consecutive pulls or you're on a racetrack or something that has a lot of heat soak. Yeah. Or you drive like me. <laughs> Allegedly. 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 <laughs> on country roads, every straightaway is a, anyway. <laughs> anyway, that's it today for Tech Tip Tuesday. Um, thanks for joining us. We'll see you next week. Thank you.